Hey everyone, this is Jonathan Larson with TYT Investigates and uh, we had some technical troubles and for all I know we're going to again so the uh, folks among you who are still with me, you are saints and I am going to be petitioning the Vatican on your behalf. So thanks for sticking around. Uh, I do want to start with a couple of quick notices. One is I'm going to be especially unbearable today um, in my in my vindicationness, uh, as you'll see later on. Um, and the other is that I I really want to keep the live chat replay available for people to see uh, after the fact. And when I lop off the top of these commentaries the entire live chat seems to go away. So my plan going forward is not to lop off the top, which also is going to mean that I'm going to spend less time yammering on at the top, asking folks to subscribe, asking you to share our content if you, if you like what we're doing here. Um, I will, however, continue to try to do these at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Time every weekday uh, on the nose, which is not what I achieved today. I'm about 15 minutes late, thanks for a technical technical difficulties. So again, thank you for being um, so patient. Let's start. Let's get started. So um, Ambassador William Taylor testified yesterday for, I believe, about 10 hours before the House uh, Impeachment Committee uh, the committees and um, answered questions for many hours. And what we do know, we know very little about exactly what he said, but we do have the opening statement. And in a fun little bit of journalism-ness, this is how the Washington Post uh, printed it out. This was the document that the Washington Post shared. If you see the shadow, it recurs on page after page. And pretty clearly what it is is someone holding up their cell phone to take a picture of this. Um, and the New York Times has a very clean, elegant uh, PDF, which I think kind of is a nice little illustration exemplar of the difference in the two papers, at least historically, maybe less so now. So what I wanted to do was just quickly walk through, and by quickly I mean not quickly, um, just walk through some of the highlights and, and hopefully add some useful context to what William Taylor had to say. So if you didn't have time to read the articles, or if you wanted to get a, a more, uh, some, somewhat more substantive quotes in context, you've come to the right place. If you've already been following the news, today might be the TYT I Daily that you want to skip, um, especially if you're not looking forward to me being unbearable, which, which is coming. So here's on the opening statement. First, he talks about his credentials. He's been honored to serve under every administration, Republican and Democratic, since 1985. I've served the country starting as a cadet at West Point, then as an infantry officer for six years, including with the 101st Airborne Division in Vietnam, then at the Department of Energy, then on the Senate staff, then at NATO, then with the State Department here and abroad, Afghanistan, Iraq, Jerusalem, Ukraine, and more recently at the nonpartisan United States Institute of Peace. So he's establishing his credentials, which is fine and good and appropriate. That's what you do. You introduce yourself, right? Um, one thing I want to point out, though, is the... The, the, there's a tendency, especially with the media, especially with military vets, to point to military service as a, a signal of something. Typically integrity, trustworthiness, nonpartisanification. Uh, and that's bad. Um, we've seen that uh, Republicans allied with President Trump have dismissed out of hand testimony or accounts or reports that come from people who are registered Democrats. Like that, that 35 to 40 percent of the population has now been essentially marginalized and rendered um, uh, not credible. And that's, that's not okay. You're allowed to have political leanings and also be a credible witness. Um, and it's understandable why people say, you know, President Trump was rebuked by a Republican judge, uh, you know, it's, it's establishing that they're going against their tribal uh, inclinations and tribal incentives. It's going to be more difficult for that judge to show up at the cocktail party than it would be for a Democratic judge. So there is an understandable thing there, but we shouldn't confuse that with credibility. So it's, it's great, and it's not a bad thing that Taylor has all of these credentials, 
but we also shouldn't automatically ascribe more uh, uh, credibility to him than we would to someone who was, uh, you know, cleaning the tables where these meetings took place and and had no military service, but knew what they were talking about and came forward. He writes, in August and September of this year, I became increasingly concerned that our relationship, United States relationship with Ukraine was being fundamentally undermined by an irregular informal channel of US policy making and by the withholding of vital security assistance for domestic political reasons. This is a theme you don't necessarily see in a lot of the coverage, which is the idea of there were two channels. Um, and that's not a reference to, th there are usually diplomatic back channels, right? That's one of these channels, that's normal. That's a normal diplomatic state of affairs for, for there to be um, ongoing communications between people who represent uh, the various seats of power. What Taylor is talking about, and which he and I will flesh out, is that there was a separate channel of communications and apparent policy making that increasingly begins to diverge from the more normal one. And it, the, this second channel is, was made up of and staffed and peopled in a much more aberrational way as, as he documents. And that matters, as we'll get to. Okay, he says, he explains why, why this matters, not just for our domestic politics, but for Earth, essentially. He writes, Quote, if Ukraine succeeds in breaking free of Russian influence, it is possible for Europe to be whole, free, democratic, and at peace. In contrast, if Russia dominates Ukraine, Russia will again become an empire oppressing its people and threatening its neighbors and the rest of the world. This is a deeply personal issue for Taylor, both on a global scale, but also on uh, an intimate scale. He talks later about being on what amounts to the front lines uh, in Ukraine, seeing Russian military forces, speaking with Ukraine military forces who are who literally have their lives on the line. He's asked earlier this year to become America's top diplomat in Kiev, Ukraine's capital. He's approached by Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. I wanted to say yes, Taylor writes, but it was not an easy decision. The former ambassador, Masha Yovanovitch, had been treated poorly caught in a web of political machinations, both in Kiev and in Washington. I feared that those problems were still present. Uh, he has a very authorly voice here and he does some nice foreshadowing. When I talked to her, Yovanovitch, the, the diplomat, the ambassador, who was bounced for no apparent reason related to cause, when I talked to her about accepting the offer, however, she urged me to go, to go to Kiev to represent the US, both for policy reasons and for the morale of the embassy. I worried about what I had heard concerning the role of Rudolf Giuliani, who had made several high-profile statements about Ukraine and U.S. policy toward the country. So during my meeting with Secretary Pompeo on May 28th, while he's considering accepting the offer, I made clear to Pompeo and the others present that if U.S. policy toward Ukraine changed, the U.S. policy being, we've got your back, we expect to provide you with military assistance, if that policy changed, he, Pompeo, would not want me posted there and I could not stay. He, Pompeo, assured me that the policy of strong support for Ukraine would continue and that he would support me in defending that policy. Taylor says yes, accepts the job, goes to Kiev. Quote, once I arrived in Kiev, I discovered a weird combination of encouraging, confusing, and ultimately alarming circumstances. So encouraging is kind of fascinating here because... Um, one of the unbearable things, the unbearable thing I'm going to be doing today is talking about, yay, I got things right. And I screwed up one big thing, so I will get to that one later too. Um, but one of the things that I pointed out was that Trump's complaints about Ukraine's um, anti-corruption efforts came after Zelensky had been in office for about three days and was apparently based on nothing. So here's what, here's what Taylor found encouraging. Zelensky had appointed reformist ministers, this is immediately after taking office, and supported long-stalled anti-corruption legislation. So Zelensky has appointed reformers and is backing 
anti-corruption legislation. He took quick executive action, including opening Ukraine's high anti-corruption court, which had been established but prior, quote, but never allowed to operate. He called new parliamentary elections. He changed the Ukrainian constitution to remove absolute immunity from the parliamentary deputies, quote, which had been the source of raw corruption for two decades. So Donald Trump in the White House says, I'm not sure about this guy and his commitment to fighting, to fighting corruption. And what Taylor is telling us here is that this guy literally rewrote the constitution of his country almost immediately after getting into office to make politicians more accountable and more vulnerable to criminal prosecution. So other than rewriting the constitution, which given Trump's remarks about the phony emoluments clause, he ought to be okay with, it's not clear what other standard Trump claims Ukraine had not met in general, in, in broad strokes for its anti-corruption uh, efforts. So uh, Taylor now talks about what the two channels are of US policymaking and implementation. He calls one regular and one highly irregular. The irregular informal channel of US policymaking with respect to Ukraine would included then special envoy Kurt Volker. He's the envoy, the special US envoy uh, on the Ukraine conflict. Ambassador Sondland, this is Gordon Sondland, the US ambassador to the EU of which Ukraine is not a part. So Sondland, no, no apparent portfolio there. And Secretary of Energy Rick Perry, who has an energy portfolio for sure, and there are legitimate energy issues here, but Perry is not the appropriate point person for carrying out uh, the broader diplomatic mission of the United States. And as I subsequently learned, Mr. Giuliani, the president's personal lawyer. Now here's what gets, where it, this gets interesting because the two channels overlapped. He writes, I was clearly in the regular channel, career diplomats, but I was also in the irregular one to the extent that ambassadors Volker and Sondland included me in certain conversations. Certain, emphasis added, because he makes a point of saying he was not included in all the conversations. He was only read in on some conversations after the fact. In late June, quote, one of the goals of both channels, the regular diplomatic channel, the irregular one, was to facilitate a visit by President Zelensky to the White House for a meeting with President Trump, which Trump had promised in his congratulatory letter of May 29th. During my subsequent communications with ambassadors Volker and Sondland, they relayed to me that the president, quote, wanted to hear from Zelensky, unquote, before scheduling the meeting. It was not clear to me what this meant. Again, with the foreshadowing, he, he's good. On June 27th, Ambassador Sondland told me during a phone conversation that Zelensky needed to make clear to President Trump that he, President Zelensky, was not standing in the way, standing in the way of, quote, investigations. I sensed something odd when Ambassador Sondland told me on June 28th, the next day, that he did not wish to include most of the regular interagency participants in a call planned with President Zelensky later that day. Ambassador Sondland said that he wanted to make sure no one was transcribing or monitoring as they added Zelensky to the call. Also before Zelensky joined the call, Ambassador Volker separately told the U.S. participants on this call that he, Ambassador Volker, planned to be explicit with Zelensky in a one-on-one -on -one meeting in Toronto about what President Zelensky should do to get the White House meeting. In other words, the asks here were being quarantined away from the regular diplomatic channels. Ambassador Volker noted, sorry, Taylor says, it was not clear to me on that call what this meant, but Ambassador Volker noted that he would relay that President Trump wanted to see rule of law, transparency, but also specifically cooperation on invest investigations to quote, get to the bottom of things. I think we all have enough background now on what this, on on this story to know what that meant. By mid-July, it was becoming clear to me that the meeting President Zelensky wanted was conditioned on the investigations of Burisma, that's the bank where Hunter Biden served on the board, and alleged Ukrainian interference in the 2016 US elections. It was also clear that this condition was driven by the irregular policy channel, not the main policy channel. The main policy channel's primary goals, remember, 
were support for Ukraine. The irregular policy channels, primary, primary goals, were things to get from uh, Ukraine. The irregular policy channel, I had come to understand, was guided by Mr. Giuliani. That's Taylor talking again. again. On July 10th, in Kiev, Ukraine's capital, I met with President Zelensky's chief of staff, Andrei Bodan, and then, and then the person who was then the foreign policy advisor to the president and was now the, and is now the foreign minister, uh, Vadim Pristaiko, who told me that they had heard from Mr. Giuliani that the phone call between the two presidents was unlikely to happen and that they were alarmed and disappointed. So the whole thing about Ukraine not feeling pressured about things, here are two of Zelensky's top people saying that they're alarmed and disappointed that they're not going to get one of the things that was on their priority list. Here's where we get a glimpse into the heart of the White House, and we'll, I'll, I'll explain why this is um, so problematic in just a second. It's a long paragraph, but it should be pretty clear, easy to follow, so bear with me. Quote, in a regular NSC, National Security Council, secure video conference call on July 18th, I heard a staff person from the Office of Management and Budget, OMB, that's the purse strings, say that there was a hold on security assistance to Ukraine, but could not say why. So this is not a diplomat now. This is the money people saying, no, you can't have the money for, for Ukraine, and no, I'm not going to tell you why. But this is a money person now. They know who gets the money and who does not. Toward the end of an otherwise normal meeting, a voice on the call, the person was off screen, said that she was from OMB, the budget office, and that her boss, her boss, put a pin in that, had instructed her not to approve any additional spending of security assistance for Ukraine until further notice. I and others, remember this is a National Security Council video conference, so others means NSC, sat in astonishment. The Ukrainians were fighting the Russians and counted on not only the training and weapons, but also the assurance of U.S. support. All that the OMB, the budget staff person, said was that the directive had come from the president to the chief of staff to OMB. And you remember I referred earlier to the OMB staffer's boss? And now here it says the directive had come from the president to the chief of staff to OMB. The directive doesn't have to come very far from the president to the chief of staff to OMB because the chief of staff is Mick Mulvaney, who's also head of the OMB. It's literally the same person. And this person, that was the boss in question. So Mick Mulvaney, the White House chief of staff, told budget staffers, Ukraine doesn't get the money, and I'm not telling you why, but it's coming from President Trump. Mulvaney, as you'll remember, I believe it was last week, said on camera, of course there was a quid pro quo. How else are you, how else are you gonna get uh, your quos without spending a few quid? Um, that's a little UK joke. Uh, okay, Taylor continues. In an instant, I realized that one of the key pillars of our strong support for Ukraine was threatened. The irregular policy channel was running contrary to the goals of long-standing U.S. policy. So that's Taylor's political awakening there. Here's something I haven't seen a lot in the reporting. At one point, the Defense Department was asked to perform an analysis of the effectiveness of the assistance, the U.S. financial assistance, training assistance, all of that, to, to Ukraine. Within a day, the Defense Department came back with the determination that the assistance was effective and should be resumed. My understanding was the Secretaries of Defense and State, the CIA Director, and the National Security Advisor sought a joint meeting with the President to convince him to release the hold. In other words, all the agencies, soft and hard power, uh, covert and overt, were trying to tell the President this is a matter of international security, if not national security. But such a meeting was hard to schedule, and the hold, la the hold lasted well into September. At this point, Taylor writes about um, information he gets from two NSC briefings, Fiona Hill and Alexander Vindman. He says they did confirm that the hold and security assistance for Ukraine came from Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney, and that the Chief of Staff maintained a skeptical view of Ukraine. If you look at Mulvaney's uh, resume, not a lot of reason to think he's steeped in foreign policy and has a deep knowledge of Zelensky's background uh, to, to inform his skepticism here. 
In the same July 19th phone call, they gave me an account of the July 10 meeting with the Ukrainian officials at the White House. Specifically, this was a meeting that uh, Taylor had not been privy to. Now he's finding out about it. They, the two NSC National Security Council, uh, Council staffers, told me that Ambassador Sondland, that's the U.S. ambassador to the EU, had connected investigations with an Oval Office meeting for President Zelensky. In other words, the U.S. ambassador to the EU at this White House meeting told the Ukrainian officials, if you want a White House meeting with the president, we want investigations. This communication from Zelensky, quoting again from Taylor, quote, so irritated Ambassador Bolton, the head of the NSC at the time, that he abruptly ended the meeting. He also directed Hill from the NSC to brief the lawyers. Hill said that Ambassador Bolton referred to this as a drug deal. John Bolton referred to Sondland's request of Ukraine as a drug deal after the July 10th meeting. Needless to say, the Ukrainians in the meetings were confused. Ambassador Bolton in the regular, right, Bolton as NSC, he belongs in the regular uh, Ukraine policy decision-making channel, wanted to talk about security, energy, and reform. Ambassador Sondland, I'm quote, this is quoting Taylor's testimony. Ambassador Sondland, a participant in the irregular channel, wanted to talk about the connection between a White House meeting and Ukrainian investigations. Sondland said that a call between Trump and Zelensky would take place soon. Volker, that's the U.S. envoy to the Ukrainian conflict, said that, this is in a text, what was most important is for Zelensky to say that he will help investigation and address any specific personnel issues if there are any. Ambassador Sondland tells Taylor that he had recommended to President Zelensky that he use the phrase, I will leave no stone unturned with regard to investigations when he spoke with President Trump. Also on July 20th, Taylor spoke with another aide for Zelensky, during which the aide said that President Zelensky did not want to be used as a pawn in a U.S. re-election campaign. So they, the, all the pressure, again, that Trump said publicly that Ukraine was not feeling, they were feeling. They were not only feeling it, they were expressing alarm about it to the regular policy channel. The next day, I texted both Ambassadors Volker and Sondland about President Zelensky's concern. On July 25th, that's five, five days later, four days later, Trump and Zelensky had the long-awaited phone conversation. Strangely, even though I was chief of mission and was scheduled to meet with Zelensky the following day, I received no readout of the call from the White House. They didn't tell the top U.S. diplomat to Ukraine what had happened in the meeting. Why do you think that is? Afterwards, ambas this, is, this is not crucial to understanding what wrongdoing took place. This is crucial to why it matters to Taylor to come forward, to risk so much, to speak knowing that it would be public against the president. It's a, it's a personal thing to him, clearly, and here he explains why. Ambassador Volker and I traveled to the front line in northern Donbass to receive a briefing from the commander of the forces on the line of contact. Arriving for the briefing in the military headquarters, the commander thanked us for security assistance. But I, Taylor, was aware that this assistance was on hold, which made me uncomfortable. Can you imagine? You're talking to a guy who's literally in the sniper sights of Russian troops, and he thanks you for help that you know at the moment is not coming. Uncomfortable is a diplomatic way for a diplomat to put this. Ambassador Volker and I could see, they could literally see the armed and hostile Russian-led forces on the other side of the damaged bridge across the line of contact. Over 13,000 Ukrainians had been killed in the war, one or two every week. More Ukrainians would undoubtedly die without the U.S. assistance. These were real-world material consequences for living flesh and blood people. Okay, at this point we get a new character in the saga, uh, Hill's replacement at the National Security Council, a guy named Tim Morrison. Morrison reads in um, Taylor on a conversation 
but on the conversation between Trump and Zelensky. This is the conversation that Taylor didn't get a readout on. Quote, Mr. Morrison told me that the call, quote, could have been better, which sounds like a synonym for imperfect, which would be not perfect, and that President Trump had suggested that President Zelensky or his staff meet with Mr. Giuliani and Attorney General William Barr. And again, as I talked earlier, and this is my vindication, <laughs> vindication tour, I, I'll cop to that right now. As I mentioned in an earlier commentary, the way to avoid getting caught is to parcel things out. So you can say to your victim, give me what I want. I'm not going to tell you what I want, but I will give you what you want if you give me what I want. And now you should go talk to some other person. So you're now not on record saying explicitly what you want, but that other person, your personal lawyer, Rudolph Giuliani, America's mayor, he's going to be pretty explicit. Um, here's another fascinating exchange, really important, really underreported. On August 16th, I exchanged text messages with Ambassador Volker, again, that's the U.S. envoy to the Ukraine conflict, in which I learned that Mr. Yermak, that's, uh, that's an aide to Zelensky, had asked that the United States submit an official request for an investigation into Burisma's alleged violations of Ukrainian law, if that is what the United States desired. A formal U.S. request to the Ukrainians to conduct an investigation based on violations of their own law struck me as improper, and I recommended to Amb Ambassador Volker that we, steer, that we stay clear. The reason that's so important, and the reason it doesn't appear to have been acted on, is likely, and I'm hypothesizing here and speculating, which, you know, slap me on the wrist, but... The political purpose served by the investigation would have been entirely negated if the investigation had been prompted by a U.S. inquiry, meaning the only reason Trump specifically needed a public announcement, because public is emphasized multiple times here, the only reason Trump needed it to be public and needed it not to come from the U.S. was so that he could point to it as something that was independent of him and therefore credible in a nonpartisan, non-political way. Had the request come from the United States Department of Justice, it would have gotten written off as politically motivated. Which means if they didn't bother to pursue that path, it can be written off as politically motivated. All right, let's see what else we've got here. Uh, doo -doo -doo, um, Okay, Mike Pence, your next president, America. Um, let's let's all let's all bookmark this this clause here, this this section, for Mike Pence's impeachment hearings. On September first, President Zelensky met with Vice President Mike Pence at a bilateral meeting in Warsaw. Now, according to Morrison, remember that's the NSC official who's not apparently part of this irregular channel of communications and policy, tells Taylor that the vice president said to Zelensky that President Trump wanted the Europeans to do more to support Ukraine and that he wanted the Ukrainians to do more to fight corruption, which, as we've established, is code for go get Hunter Biden. During this same phone call I had with Mr. Morrison, he went on, that's the NSC staffer, remember, to describe a conversation Ambassador Sondland had with Zelensky's aide uh, in Warsaw. Ambassador Sondland told the aide that the security assistance money would not come until Zelensky uh, uh, excuse me, uh, committed to pursue the Burisma investigation. I sent Sondland a text message asking it if, quote, we are now saying that a security assistance and a White House meeting are conditioned on investigations. Now, we know already that we knew about that text, and we knew that Sondland said, call me. What we didn't know was what happened on the phone call. So Taylor tells us. During that phone call, Ambassador Sondland told me that President Trump had told him that he wants President Zelensky to state publicly, 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 that Ukraine will investigate Burisma and alleged Ukrainian interference in the 2016 U.S. election. 
That's why Sondland is now apparently in some hot water because Taylor, who Sondland vouched for as a credible source, is now undercutting Sondland's account of events. Taylor continues about Ambassador Sondland. Sondland also told me that he now recognized that he had made a mistake by earlier telling the Ukrainian officials that a White House meeting with Zelensky was dependent on a public announcement of investigations. Not that it was a mistake to say that it was dependent on anything. It was a mistake to say that it was dependent on only investigations. Quoting again. In fact, Ambassador Sondland said, quote, everything was dependent on such an announcement, including security assistance. Excuse me, I had that backwards. It wasn't that, that Ukraine could lose only the White House meeting. They could lose all the security assistance if they didn't do the investigations. That was the mistake Sondland said he made. He said that President Trump wanted Zelensky, quote, in a public box by making a public statement. All right, I'm going to try and skip through some of the rest because I think... Uh, We've hit most of the high points, but it, it's really it's really worth reading. Um, okay, Morrison, and I suspect Mr. Morrison is going to become a lot more famous in the coming days, tells Taylor about a phone conversation um, on September seventh between Sondland, again part of the irregular policy channel, and President Trump. So this is Trump talking directly to Sondland, and then Morrison, the NSC, briefing. Taylor about it. Quote, Mr. Morrison said that he had a sinking feeling after learning about this conversation. According to Mr. Morrison, President Trump, Trump told Ambassador Sondland that he was not asking for a quid pro quo, but President Trump did insist that Zelensky go to a microphone publicly, 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 and say he is opening investigations of Biden and 2016 election inter interference and that Zelensky should want to do this himself. Sondland said that he had talked to President Zelensky and his aide and told them that, although this was not a quid pro quo, if President Zelensky did not clear things up, did not want the things Trump wanted him to want, did not clear things up in public, 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 we would be at a, quote, stalemate. I, Taylor, understood a stalemate to mean that Ukraine would not receive the much-needed military assistance. Ambassador Sondland said that this conversation concluded with Zelensky agreeing to make a public statement. Uh, so those are the those are the highlights of the testimony, and I want I, I left out some of the bigger things that have gotten more attention, but I, I wanted to focus a little bit on some of the smaller things that have not. Um, and uh, one one point I wanted to make about this was this is not complicated. Um, there are a lot of players. And there's a timeline to keep track of, but the, the precipitating crime here has essentially been stipulated to by the suspect in public on camera. So it's, it's uh, understandable why people would say, well, you don't need to prove quid pro quo. That's true. You don't need a whole bunch of witnesses to confirm quid pro quo. Also true. You've got, you've got a signed confession. So are Democrats dragging their feet? Why is this happening behind closed doors? Why aren't they doing it out in the open? Why are we doing this at all? Just hold the vote. Some Republicans are even saying this. And I would say, and you can call this a defense of the process if you want, but I would say that not everyone, I don't want to shock anyone, is listening to this webcast. <laughs> not everyone follows this stuff. People are getting their kids to school. Um, people are going on dates. Uh, people are having lives. People are doing the crossword puzzle. It takes time for these things to gain momentum in the public sphere to the point where everyone gets it. And that's appropriate. That's okay. We're supposed to have mechanisms in our machinery to avoid rushes to judgment. Um, and if you look at the polls and if you listen to Republican politicians, the trends are moving in the direction you would want them to. So it's not as if this is a strike while the iron is hot moment of opportunity. This is a process that has moved people and is continuing to move people. Um, so um, that's pretty much 
what I wanted to say. I had some other points about that. The, there, there are so many fingerprints here of, of evidence of wrongdoing, right? You've got not only people coming forward and claiming it, but you have what's clearly the establishment of an abnormal, aberrational, unaccountable, um, non-transparent, parallel track operating in semi-secrecy, which only gives itself away in those moments when it needs the, the input or the support of the regular track of, of diplomacy. A and it's, it's very important to, to wonder and ask, within this White House or any White House, what gets done when, those, when there are no people like Taylor who exist in both of those channels? We may have those, those parallel irregular policy making channels at work right now in the White House with no transparency, operating entirely independently without any kind of interaction, knowledge, transparency from the regular channels. So there's a lot more to go, go on here. Um, and one point I did want to make about um, uh, Republican response here, Mark Meadows, Republican of North Carolina, who was in on these hearings, he, he sat through testimony here. This is based on the New York Times reporting. Quoting Meadows, he says, I've been in there for 10 hours, meaning Taylor's testimony. I can assure you there was no quid pro quo. This is Meadows, Republican Mark Meadows talking. Quote, I can tell you there is not evidence that there was any condition placed on the aid. So, as with many words, the word evidence uh, has come to lose some of its actual real meaning. Evidence is not proof. Evidence is also not merely fingerprints. You don't have to prove something for a, 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 a thing does not have to be proof to qualify as evidence. It can be a reason to believe that a thing may have happened. And evidence not only includes, but is very largely consists of testimony. Eyewitness testimony is evidence, right? Um, that's part of a trial is presenting evidence. Evidence includes testimony by witnesses. So this is evidence. So don't, don't let the notion that just because there's not a piece of paper that Trump signed saying, regarding my quid pro quo, make it so, that doesn't mean that there's no evidence. So he's, um, he might not agree that the evidence is conclusive, Meadows, but it is evidence, right? We can't, we can't let this Orwellian uh, redefinition of words get that out of hand. Okay, so with that, I'm going to finally shut up and see what you folks are saying in uh, the chat box. And boy, are you guys robust here. Um, I already lost Mr. Elder to Majority Report, I think. Um, again, I will say, I like Sam. Majority Report is great. You guys should watch it. Uh, X-Force says, you know, Melania is legit um, an undocumented immigrant, X-Force, come on, do better, uh, who came here and worked illegally on a guest visa that she overstayed. Oh, come on, X-Force, lots of sexist, uncool language here. Come on, let's be better. Isn't that Melania's slogan, be best, be better, something like that? Um, let's see. Uh, Monkey King says, honestly, Donald shouldn't be the president. Well, that's apparently what they're going to be looking at. Uh, uh, Jacobo Fernandez, I don't know if I'm saying your name correctly, but um, I don't recall seeing it before, so thank you for joining us. Uh, he says, it would be great if Pompeo, Pence, Trump all get removed. It would be a dream come true. Um, it, would, it, would be, it would be quite the historic seismic um, phenomenon. Doug Grinbergs says, who'd be surprised if Sondland is using purchased EU ambassador gig to line up deals for his boutique hotels? Oh, I didn't even get to the, the part, the, this great, great, great quote. It, it has had some play, but I'll share it again. Um, During a call on September 8th, Ambassador Sondland tried to explain to me that President Trump is a businessman. This is, this is, in the context of Sondland trying to convince Taylor that there's no quid quo quo. 
Taylor goes on to describe Sondland saying, when a businessman is about to sign a check to someone who owes him something, the businessman asks that person to pay up before signing the check. Ambassador Volker used the same terms several days later. I argued to both that the explanation made no sense. Ukrainians did not owe President Trump anything, and holding up security assistance for domestic political gain was crazy, as he had said in his text uh, message, which has already been made public. But I think that notion that even people who were ostensibly operating, Sondland, again, is a business person, never held a job in the public sphere prior to becoming the United States ambassador to the European Union, was, however, a secret million dollar donor to the Trump inauguration uh, fund. So what's really toxic and, and horrific and tragic and heartbreaking about a lot of this is this notion, is this apparent notion that American taxpayer dollars and, and the lives of Ukrainians at the spear tip of that money were all seen as just commodities um, to be utilized by the person who held the purse strings, President Trump, to get things that he wanted. There was no sense of the sanctity of the role, of the, of the responsibility and the, the, the sacredness of discharging funds that have been entrusted to you, willingly or not, they've been entrusted to you by the people you represent to serve the country, to uphold the Constitution. And there are the lives of Ukrainians dying at the rate of one or two a week um, who are essentially upholding, uh, who are defending what, what, a, what Ambassador Taylor describes as a, a last line of defense, uh, preventing the permeability of Europe to, to uh, Russian imperialism. These are sacred things, and I say that in the secular sense, but that makes them no less sacred to me. Um, these are sacred things, and to see them tainted this way and commodified as chits in, in, this, in this quid pro quo -y transactional dynamic, it's, it's, it's sickening. It's really sickening. Monkey King says the, re the leaders are a reflection of the people as a whole. I think that's overly determinative, but I understand the point you're making, and I, I do agree with it to the extent that the number of people who are willing to tolerate it by not being active, um, that's also a reflection on us. Low voter turnout, that's, it's all a reflection. Uh, x Force says, don't forget McConnell, Nunez, and Graham. Um, X-Force points out the majority voted for Clinton. Um, <laughs> Kalita says she's pretty sure I'm being broadcast on Times Square, John. I, that would be very bad. Leonardo sa Da Vinci says, who does crossword puzzles? Um, Doug Grinbergs says, if White House Mafia thought Marie Yovanovitch, I is Masha or Marie, was blocking their Ukraine criminal enterprise, why would Pompeo and the mob pick another honest, dedicated career diplomat for Ukraine ambassador gig? Well, maybe Pompeo was genuinely supportive of the stated goal. And maybe no one had told him because they don't want to tell people that they were hoping to get something else out of these dynamics. Um, you know, it's, it's not always the way these things are carried out is seldom clear because it seldom can be clear. So you end up with people who, who toss monkey wrenches into the works. x Force says individual greed, but people do organize it like the six guys who owned 25% of the world's wealth in 1910 and created the Federal Reserve in 1913. I started to read that book. It was crazy. I wish I had continued it. Why, why did I stop reading it? It was wild. I actually started to read that book. Um, Let's see. Uh, Price and Pride says, thank you for your analysis. Um, thank you for your thanks. Uh, and thank you for your support and for being here. Um, and, and for what it's worth, there's better analysis out there. I, I'm just hoping that this is sort of a, I can provide us the service of a, of a handy Cliff's Notes to some of the points that maybe aren't getting highlighted in some of the more mainstream stuff. Um, Leonardo da Vinci says, I don't do crossword puzzles. I do Red Dead Redemption 2 online. I've never played that. 
but I am friends with one of the stars. So um, that's an unexpected moment of me being unbearable today. There's more to come. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to move on to my surprise second topic of the day, which is even more in the weedsy, and here's where I get full on, on unbearable. So um, if you are new to TYT Investigates, uh, you may not know that I've been doing a lot of reporting on Pete Buttigieg, and um, people are not happy about it. <laughs> I hear on Twitter, every time I post a story, I get a flood of people almost always identified as Buttigieg fans, which is okay. That's natural. That's not disqualifying. It doesn't mean they're wrong. Um, who accuse me of being in the tank for Bernie or, or not liking Pete Buttigieg or being obsessed or whatever it might be. Um, and, you know, I get defensive about it. Uh, I'm a human being. Maybe I am too obsessed. You know, I try to be reflective. I try to think about these things. Um, on the other hand, I'm also like Al Pacino in Godfather 3. I'm, I'm also trying to get out. But the thing with beat reporting is once you engage and you start to surface stories that have not been for a while, then people come to you and conversations begin and, and then it's much easier to report on subsequent things. And so it just makes a lot more sense from a cost benefit analysis of, hey, should I start some whole new thing? Or there's this other story I could very easily report with just a few days work. So um, last month we reported uh, on these uh, secret police tapes and we revealed that the city has legal documents in which Police are described on the tapes as discussing a plan to use Buttigieg's donors back in 2011, before he was elected mayor, to get him to agree to get rid of the city's black police chief. One of the police officers in question is quoted as saying, uh, I'm paraphrasing, it'll be a fun time when all white people are in charge. Now, um, I also, over the course of the summer, uh, and with help from a, a great freelancer in... Um, South Bend named Jeff Harrell, did other reporting revealing things that have gone unreported for years in South Bend, which has local media there. There's TV stations, there's a local newspaper. And none of them have picked up on, on any of our reporting until recently, because now it appears that the city council, which is known as the Common Council, is apparently considering dropping its lawsuit to force the release of the tapes um, the reasoning of the people who support dropping the lawsuits being that, well, the Young Turks has reported this stuff. Uh, we just need to find out whether that's, that, that's, that reporting is true. So maybe we can just ask people who would know, hey, is that true or not? Um, and so now, because of that council position, now some of our reporting is starting to make it into the local newspaper. And yesterday on local TV, they said the Young Turks for the first time, referring to our reporting and how it has spurred uh, a re-examination of the council's legal strategy going forward. Over the weekend, and I discussed this earlier in the week, the South Bend Tribune put out an editorial in which they said the city council should continue its lawsuit. Um, should continue to fight to get these tapes released. Yesterday, the president of the Common Council in South Bend, this is the most uh, high-ranking legislative person in the city of South Bend. I, I believe, based on the structure of the city, this would be the second most powerful person in the city after Pete Buttigieg. That's Tim Scott, and he released a statement responding to the editorial, and I'm going to read it because I'm going to be unbearable today. He starts essentially quoting himself. This is Tim Scott, council president. Quote, there is support for full transparency on the operations of city government. We were concerned with the decisions and the processes behind the firing of communications director Karen DePape and demotion of former police chief Daryl Boykins. We haven't changed our view on the importance of the public's right to know. The council also shouldn't change its stance on full transparency, end quote. Then Scott continues. This is what I said and what the South Bend Common Council still believes. 
One council member's remarks does not change our dedication to seeking the truth. That refers, referring to another member of the council who was talking about um, uh, possibly dropping the lawsuit. So he's, he's saying one council member's remarks don't change our dedication to seeking the truth. He continues, seven years ago, this common council issued subpoenas regarding the firing of DePape and the demotion of Boykins. Subpoenas meaning subpoenas for the tapes, which were, uh, they did not succeed with that. During the intervening time, Mayor Pete Buttigieg's legal team stalled and extended the case only to drop out of the fight a year ago while racking up 83% of the legal costs, something over $2 million in total, and financially settling with those who were involved in the case without the involvement of the South Bend Common Council. Some, for some context, the council gets hit um, as being the primary driver of the more than $2 million in legal costs. But So what Scott is saying here is, most of the legal costs, 83%, actually came from Buttigieg's legal fees and Buttigieg's decision to pay out settlements to everyone in this case. Cops who were on the tapes, cops who were mentioned on the tapes, they got, uh, I believe, 500,000. Um, Daryl Boykins, the black police chief, he got a settlement. Karen DePape, the woman who heard the tapes, made the tapes, and was fired, she got a settlement. The South Bend, the, the Common Council's costs, I believe, are only something uh, just, shy, just, just north of 300000 relatively small over the course of seven years in a $2 million legal, legal bill. But the Tribune often describes that $2 million figure uh, only in reference to costs incurred by the Common Council. Scott continues, now a second group of intervening South Bend police officers, these are new litigants, continue to stall and block the release of the tapes and continue to cloud over the transparency the citizens of South Bend desire from their police department and their city government. Here's the thing I got wrong. I believe, I said earlier this week, that the original officers who tried to block the release of the tapes were still party to it. My understanding now is that I was wrong about that and it's only these new litigants who stand in the way, which is a fascinating thing on its own right. So I apologize for getting that wrong and I'm, I'm hoping I'm getting it right now. <coughs> Excuse me. In those seven years since the tape's existence became public, this common council has considered many strategies and many options to find the most prudent path to the truth and what is on the recordings. This is what all parties do in a legal fight. Here we get to the, the why and how I'm being unbearable today. Quoting the council president now. The latest journalist investigation by the media group, the Young Turks, has delved deeper with more information and insight than any journalist or media group has done in the past seven years. The Young Turks have brought to this common council information it has had no legal way to see before. This common council requested an extension of the legal proceedings to understand the implications of the Young Turks information, thus a part of a strategy to see if that information results in achieving the goals stated by the Common Council seven years ago without the additional costs of possibly three more years of litigation and three more years of delay. Court trial for this case is not scheduled until summer 2020 at the earliest. That would be roughly the time of the Democratic National Convention. And if the past is any indication, the case will spend two or more years in the appellate courts. He continues. The, true, the Tribune asks, what has changed? Meaning, why should you drop the case? And Scott writes, it should be obvious to anyone that the Young Turks has, for the first time, revealed documents that could independently establish what is on the recordings without the need to actually listen to the recordings. This common council owes the city of South Bend and its residents the duty to investigate and to attempt to verify what the Young Turks has brought to light. It is our responsibility for this common council to consider all new information when formulating strategy. And I should note, by the way, in terms of formulating strategy, the Common Council is meeting today, possibly right now, behind closed doors with their lawyer to discuss how to go forward. That's happening, if not right now, any minute now. But one strategy, meaning confirming the veracity of what we reported, does not mean we are giving up on the goal of seeking transparency in government, especially in relation to the South Bend Police Department and the police recordings issue. By state law, the South Bend Common Council is allowed to conduct non-public executive sessions with its attorney to discuss and develop strategies in its litigation matters. Um, and now he's, um, Scott is now uh, giving some heat to the member of the Common Council 
who apparently revealed the proceedings of executive session or the discussions in which they contemplated dropping the lawsuit. Then they say, if and when there is a major change in strategy regarding the recordings, the Common Council will vote in a public meeting as required by state law. Their next meeting is Monday. I'm going to be in South Bend. To change the legal strategy that is currently being pursued by the Common Council's attorney, the council has to vote in open session and tell the attorney, you need to pursue a new strategy. It is not allowed for them to reach a decision uh, behind closed doors without a public hearing and public vote. In other words, if the council does nothing Monday night in open session, then the lawyer continues on with the lawsuit. And then Tim Scott continues now, and he just, he, this is a declaration of war. Take it from someone who used to work in a lo at a local newspaper as a local reporter. For a, for a local politician to say what they're about to say, I mean, just the part about the Young Turks doing deeper work uh, than other media outlets, that was, that's a shot across the bow. That's a declaration of war on your local media. And I'll explain why in a minute. The business of the South Bend Tribune is to sell newspapers. Continued litigation over the recordings may assist the Tribune's business, but from my view, it is not necessarily in the best interest of the city of South Bend or its residents. What will they gain by an additional three years of litigation if the final result is nothing more than verification of the accuracy of the Young Turks' stories? The Tribune has always had the option to initiate its own litigation resulting from the city of South Bend administration officials' refusal to turn over the recordings in response to the Re Tribune's requests. It, meaning the Tribune, has apparently chosen instead to ride the coattails of the South Bend Common Council's litigation, expressing its opinions with little or no knowledge of the many factors the Common Council must consider in deciding what is in the best interest of the city of South Bend and its residents. This Common Council will move forward with the strategy around the Young Turks article and other strategies with two goals, complete transparency regarding the recordings and the people involved, and at the lowest expense to taxpayers to reveal the truth. So, <laughs> yesterday I get a call from the South Bend Tribune. They want to interview me, um, and they do. And uh, that interview, that article, appeared yesterday. It was primarily about what Scott had to say, but they also asked me, what did I think of all this? Did I think the tape should be released? Did I think that our own reporting um, should suffice uh, to, to illuminate people about what's on the tapes. Did I think the council should continue its lawsuit? Nothing I will point out about what we actually reported, the substance of what we reported. The South Bend Tribune, for instance, has still never mentioned our report about police discussing a plan to use Buttigieg's donors to get rid of the black chief. Nothing about the personnel stuff, only what we reported and had previously been alluded to in the press about um, uh, the use of racist rhetoric and possible uh, police wrongdoing. So what I told the Tribune, I'll quote the story here, um, quote, the reporter who wrote the TYT article said Tuesday it, the article, should not be presented as a substitute for the public's desire to hear the tape's full contents. Quotes, there's information that wasn't in our reporting and I'm sure there's information that wasn't in the documents, said Jonathan Larson of TYT. Quote, so if you want maximal information and transparency, then relying on the, reporting, on the reporting we've done so far, it's important information, but certainly not all the information. We didn't report that the documents purported to be a complete description of what's on the tapes, he added. Not having the tapes come out is certainly a worse outcome than having them come out. There are recordings beyond what apparently DePape described and transferred, so there's a lot of material there and no reason to think everything made it into the documents. So... What's going on here is kind of a fascinating fight over the council not wanting to be uh, having to bear the brunt of forcing these tapes to come out, but also not wanting to be in a position of letting the matter die. There is a very real passionate constituency in South Bend, not just for finding out if there's been racist police rhetoric. I reported back in April 
that at least one of the officers, by name, we named him, and we named at least one person accusing him of using racist rhetoric. Not on the tapes, in real life, in person, when she was being arrested by that guy. I had multiple law enforcement sources tell me, yeah, he used racist rhetoric. So that's a known thing. No one does not know that in South Bend. The real, the real crux of, of why to pursue this is to find out what, what Tim Scott said at the very beginning of his, of his uh, press release here. We were concerned with the decisions and the processes behind the firing of Karen DePape and demotion of Boykins. The decisions and the processes were those of Pete Buttigieg. That's why this is a national story. And yes, I, I did include a lot of granular stuff in my original report on this because it matters not just to Pete Buttigieg and not just to the country, but to the black community and the larger community in South Bend to know how these things get decided, who gets to be in the room where it happens, who's not included in, the, in those conversations, what does the public get to know about those conversations. So um, to the extent I have a position on this, and I'm very uncomfortable, I hope that's clear, being asked for my position on this, but as a reporter, I think it's pretty clear and part of the job to say, I advocate for maximal transparency. And obviously there can be countervailing legal principles and ethical principles, needless, gratuitous violation of someone's privacy, uh, you know, uh, things along those lines. And obviously the, the primary legal argument against releasing them is that they were found to have been illegally recorded, which no one's gone to jail for this. Um, no one's been prosecuted. No one's been investigated. Sorry, that's technically not true. Um, the people who were investigated were told that they weren't under investigation. There was an investigation, but no one became, despite Buttigieg's claims to the contrary, no one became a subject or a target of an investigation. The FBI looked into it back in 2012. And according to DePape and Boykins in, in um, statements that have been reported, they were both told, no, you don't have to worry about being arrested. Um, so the idea that there's some criminal wrongdoing here that would prevent the release of these tapes. And again, the law has, I believe, lots of exemptions for taping government officials on their work phones, especially police. This is not untrodden territory. All right. Um, boy, X-Force, you better still be around because I've been talking my face off today. Uh, Army of One says, thanks. Now I have in the room where it happened stuck in my head. Army of One, first of all, I think you're new to TYT Investigates, or at least TYT Out Daily, so thanks so much for being here. I hope you'll subscribe and, and um, uh, share, uh, share the stuff that we're doing with people you think would enjoy it. And I appreciate you sharing the, uh, get, I, I appreciate you getting the um, Hamilton reference. Reptile Z says, what I want to know is how many Scaramucci's from Trump out of office and the filing of divorce? Uh, I forget what Scaramucci, what, are you, what Scaramucci is a unit for. Uh, <laughs> Um, but yes, uh, let's see what else you folks have to say. So I realize what, what happened is, uh, I've been talking on so, so long that you guys, uh, justfully, uh, rightly, um, have begun talking with yourselves, which is great. I love that. Uh, Sherry Addis says, Ooh, you're famous. It's true. I've been in the South Bend Tribune now. Uh, and again, I'm very uncomfortable with that. Um, People keep expecting me, people keep saying, ooh, are you gonna go nuts at the South Bend Common Council meeting? And I'm like, I'm a reporter. I expect to be quiet as a church mouse. If there's, if there's a moment where I have an opportunity to ask questions of people who I won't otherwise, then yeah, maybe then I'll ask a question, but I'm not, I'm not gonna go Norma Ray this. Um, Kalita says, do you think those tapes should be released? How can a journalist ask that question? Well. This is a newspaper. The South Bend Tribune asked me that, given that our reporting, um, and look, I, I even said to the Tribune, they didn't include it in the article. I'm like, you guys could pay for the lawsuit too. And by the way, so could we. Someone could start a Kickstarter to uh, support the lawsuit. I told the Tribune very specifically, I don't know South Bend or the Common Council well enough to have an informed opinion about 
what mechanism should lead to the release of the tapes. But as a journalist, I think it's pretty easy to say, yes, I believe information should come out. Um, but the, the South Bend Tribune is in a slightly different position. They, um, they issued an editorial on Sunday criticizing the council's apparent or a council member's apparent reliance on our reporting to say, nothing more to see here. We don't need to, we can drop everything. The Young Turks has revealed it all. We don't need to do any more. So it's not, it's not totally nuts for them to come to the Young Turks and say, well, do you think that's right? Do you, are you telling us that there's nothing else to learn from listening to the tapes? I, I don't think that's an unfair question. I would like to see it maybe come within a broader context of additional questions and additional reporting, but um, you know, my reporting is not perfect either. I, I don't, there are questions I don't ask that I should ask all the time. So the journalism is like science. It's not supposed to be perfect. That's what engineering is for. Uh, science and, and journalism are a process and you're supposed to get it wrong. Getting it wrong and correcting it is the process. It's not an indication that the process has broken down. That's the process. Um, let's see, what else are you guys saying? Um, Larry5200 says, Trump just ended a war without Democrats' help. Um, well, okay. Uh, I'm not sure he ended it so much as ended U.S. participation in it. If anything, the U.S. departure from Syria, we're talking about Syria now, folks. The U.S. departure from Syria has led to heightened hostilities uh, and fatalities and casualties. So the war isn't over. It's gotten worse. The U.S. just isn't participating in it, which if that's your foreign policy goal, you're, that's, that's a real foreign policy goal. People can understandably say other people are going to fight. We can't be there all the time. But now they're already talking about sending U.S. troops to Iraq to deal with the uh, incursions of newly released ISIS fighters. So I'm not sure how long, I'm not sure how long the, the net number of U.S. troops in harm's way overseas is going to remain zero, but we'll see. Uh, okay. Uh, Larry5200 says, I'm giving my followers false hope again. I'm not sure I have followers. We have subscribers. I'm not a, I'm not a cult guru, Gary. Um, uh, I, I urge everyone to eat protein and I don't urge isolation. So all the things that cult gurus do, I, I try not to do those things. Um, as for false hope, I'm not sure what you think I'm giving them um, hope about. <laughs> if anything, I feel like I constantly am a stealer of hope. Hi, I'm Jonathan Larson from DUIT Investigates. And if you have any hope lying around, I'll take that right now. Thank you. Uh, Army of One says, I never got a shout out before. Thanks, man. I will become a member. Member, see? Larry, it's not follower. Member, Army of One. Thank you. Um, Michael Guy says, Medicare for all sounds like Kmart for all. And by the way, force crappy healthcare. Uh, okay. Um, let's see. x says, I am here for you, John. I support your Herculean efforts and appreciate them deeply. Too damn strong. And then he does this only with muscles on it. And um, if you're not aware, X-Force is the primary, uh, I say this in a neutral way, irritant, not in a bad way, irritant, um, provoking me to go long, even though everyone keeps posting your videos are too long. Well, look, I've been going for more than an hour and there are 118 people watching right now. So if you guys keep incentivizing me to keep talking, I'm going to still have incentive to keep talking. Leonardo da Vinci says, I'm still dying to know who you know in Red Dead Redemption 2. Um, I forget the name of her character. Uh, Amanda Kay says, I just can't believe that this story has not been picked up yet. Well, so that's a really interesting thing. And uh, as part of my, vindic my unbearable vindication, self-vindication tour, I'm going to say, I also can't believe that it hasn't been picked up yet. And I know that there have been other outlets nosing around trying to confirm what we've reported. And I have a couple theories. One is um, TYT is not widely known yet for its reporting. We have been picked up in some mainstream papers, but we're mostly known as political. And this is a story with very clear political ramifications. So maybe that's part of it. 
Also, Ken uh, Klippenstein, our senior investigative reporter, he's a monster on Twitter. So his stuff gets picked up a lot more often than mine does. I have a very um, flabby, uh, just like my, <laughs> uh, I have a very flabby Twitter following. So I don't have a lot of blue checks following me who would see me talking about these stories. Um, but that said, it's kind of starting to happen. Um, the Hill, the Capitol Hill newspaper, has a fairly vibrant and robust growing television presence called Hill TV, and they have a morning show called Rising. Um, and Crystal Ball, uh, uh, who used to work at MSNBC, I believe at the same time I did, although we didn't really uh, know each other. Uh, I don't recall that we ever even met. I apologize if we met and I forgot. Um, but uh, she's actually been... Um, uh, paying attention to some of our reporting and bringing some of it to light to her viewers. So it is kind of out there. And, and The Intercept, of course, um, Ryan Grimm, the DC bureau chief for The Intercept, he's been uh, you know, a partner of mine here at TYT, um, and we, we work on projects with an eye towards cross-publishing, and they've covered some of this stuff as well. So, um, you know, there's a lot of stories out there probably to do with any number of candidates that are not getting picked up because when we talk about picked up, a lot of that's cable news and that's very sort of myopic focus on a certain set of things that are relatively easy to cover and don't come with a lot of potential downside. Um, any outlet that decides to jump on board with covering the stuff that I'm doing, if it's a mainstream outlet with a sizable influential audience, they'll probably get a call from the Buttigieg campaign because they don't want it to get more coverage. And once one mainstream outlet picks it up, then there's a, da a danger that the wall is broken and everyone... So they're probably going to get some pushback if they, if they make calls on this and so on and so forth. I'm being speculative there. And there's nothing sinister or nefarious uh, uh, about what I described the Buttigieg campaign potentially doing. Um, it's your job. <laughs> if you're running the communication shop for a campaign, uh, when a news outlet reports on it, to get in touch with them and say, hey, here's why this story is BS. Hopefully the reasons are valid reasons, but you're, you're gonna push back, that's okay. Again, as I say all the time, we're supposed to be fighting, right? That's okay. That doesn't mean we're not united. It means we're united, e pluribus unum. We're still e, we're still pluribus, but we're also unum. We don't give up being pluribus, which means we fight. But we can fight and still be one. Uh, let's see. Um, all right. Uh, you guys are talking healthcare, which is good, important stuff, and I've been there before. Sherry Addis says Crystal loves Bernie. That seems to be the case. Um, I like Bernie. Um, Leonardo da Vinci says, I don't like the hill. It's just another CNN following the money. Look, I mean, as far as I know, everyone eats. So um, I think it's less about characterizing any given outlet as they're bad, they just want money. Um, you know, everyone wants a paycheck. Um, and in a, in a non-socialist society, you re actually need one to live and to thrive and support your family. So... Um, I wouldn't write off any given outlet. I would support work that they do that you think is in the right direction, right? Ignore the stuff that you don't like because if you, if you call it out, if you draw attention to it, that still counts. So just ignore the stuff you don't like and, but reward, actively incentivize the stuff that you do like. All right, um, at the risk of, of disappointing X-Force, I'm gonna stop talking because I'm working on another South Bend story, which I hope to have up uh, and published tomorrow morning. And um, maybe tomorrow, if you subscribe, you will catch me tomorrow morning at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Time here at TYTI Daily talking about my new story. Um, hopefully without all the unbearable pats on the back and, and uh, quotes from Common Council President Tim Scott about um, the, uh, the depth and insight of... <laughs> TYT is reporting. I always tell you guys I'm uncomfortable with compliments. I'm even uncomfortable, uncomfortable a day later talking about compliments. Um, and again, let's keep in mind that he's got a reason to want people to think that our reporting is the bee's knees. If you can rely on our reporting, then you don't need uh, a lawsuit to get the tapes out. So 
I should take it with a grain of salt and so should you. So everyone go have a grain of salt, but not too much salt because we take care of ourselves and we take care of each other and I'll see you tomorrow.